So, welcome to Natsukashi. Um, I butchered that pronunciation, probably. Natsukashi, um, Dane! No, no, that, that was pretty correct. And today we're going to be talking about Chojin Lock or Lock the Superman, an old anime film by Nippon Animation from 1984, I believe. And today I'm joined by Mr. Nice Guy. Say hello. Hello? Uh, well, Rogers. Hi. <laughs> Shojin Rock. Roger Smith. <laughs> yo. Ha. James. Yo, yo, yo. And Zaria. Hey. All right. So what did you guys think of this movie? <laughs> Anyone? Well, um, nobody know? calls it Lock um, the Superman. Not even the dub. <laughs> well, they call him it at the end. But, <laughs> S-bar. But like, the, for one, for one thing, the title, um, I mean, we didn't watch it. We watched it uh, with the dub because we couldn't find the sub, I guess. Um, You need to get on Anime Bites. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, you know, exclusive, exclusive membership. I just just prefer the uh, the dub. I know. I I, I get get to spectate the visual animation so much easier. Yeah, yeah. The dub was an experience. But what was helpful also was at the same time of us watching the dub, the, we would have the green subtitles at the bottom, uh, so there would sometimes ah, be completely yeah, different translations, subtitles. and we could tell when <laughs> when there was a line delivered, and I'm like, that's not what they said. That's not what the line's supposed to be. Oh, that's a good time. Yeah, this would... Should we give a uh, quick description or summary for people who would probably not? Never... You mean everybody? Has anyone ever heard of this? <laughs> I'm sure there's some. Yeah, there's probably I have. Not a, I suggested not a possibly. this one. But, uh, okay. hey. Okay. Roger, why don't, why don't you describe <laughs> this movie? How, what, is, what is the plot? Well, basically, you know, well, well, basically, you know, you have this immortal Esper, Espar, as they call it in the dub, named Block. <laughs> You know, who's a pretty (laughs) chill guy, and he wants to keep hidden, because essentially what's being happened is that, you know, the, uh, essentially, you have people who are trying to hunt Locke down. You have Lady Khan, who is kind of the, the, like, the main antagonist, so to speak, of the film. Um, but then you also have, with, like, Locke, you have, um, Ryu Yamaki, who is sort of like, uh, he, he's like the captain of this ship. He's a cool and, dude. Yeah, and then there's also Jessica who, like, is being... She goes to, like, the school, and she's basically being brainwashed to hate Locke because her parents were killed when she was young, and they sort of... I guess they, like, manipulate, like... Yeah, they have the... Well, I, should I go into spoilers? She has one uh, of those yeah, traumatic we're, we're, flashbacks. We're going to talk about spoilers. <laughs> Wait, they wait, mine I, Rufy well, Shirt. I guess first we should say if we would recommend this movie. Uh, um, well, I mean, yeah, the joke. <laughs> it, it, if you watch this movie, watch it dubbed is what I would say. I th- yeah, definitely. Oh, and then, I thought it was a fine film overall. Yeah, yeah I thought it was fine. I I definitely don't I w- think it was like bad necessarily. It definitely has a lot of things where if you were one of those like CinemaSin people or uh, you know extra like well, the story, uh, it would be. It would be very, uh, it would be a good laugh for you, and uh, you might, you might pick it apart. Um, but I think it's a fun time for I, just I general mean, it old anime fans. definitely starts to drag in the third act for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's overlong by far. Certainly, it has it, its issues, but uh, it, I'm sure it's we like can get framed into that. like a popcorn like action film. Yeah, but it's like two hours long. It should be like half an hour shorter. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I definitely agree on that. I think I think what I. Uh, what I kind of wanted to see from this film is a lot of action in that style that they had. Um, because you have, you have them all being psychics and it's the kind of psychic like mob psycho where they, mm-hmm. they just kind of physically emit energy and, and shit's happening all over the place. And there's a lot of trippy flashy visuals, a lot of neon. Um, and I think that could have been really cool if you had Locke as your protagonist uh, unwillingly going on this mission to stop other espers i guess uh, um and you have him face a bunch of different espers with different powers because they do have different ways of fighting uh each of them and i feel like if you had like a ninja school situation where you just have the guy and he's a badass and you have him you know he has a mission that he unwillingly goes on 
and there's a love interest, and you just uh, you just knock through a few uh, a few interesting fights. I think it could have been a really interesting film. That's just me, you know, with with wish fulfillment. That's kind of what I would have liked to see. But it, it's not something that like, is a downer on the film because it didn't do that. I just think when watching this film, there was a lot. There was this moment. There was this one longer scene where Locke was facing this guy who would like manipulate rocks and like the earth, and he'd kind of like have earth powers or something. And there was an uh, opportunity for a lot of interesting action and a lot of different um, attacks and everything. And I. I don't know. I would like to see different different Espars uh, fighting and everything. You also had that dynamic with um, that group of people um, who, who it was like their entourage or something. Do you guys remember that? Like the, the yeah. group of people. Yeah. Wait, wouldn't you like to see like all the different things that they could do? Yeah, that yeah, was kind of lacking. Yeah, one of the problems uh, kind of up front you're going to realize with the film is that. You can tell it's kind of maybe structured to be like originally like a, a series or an OVA that they kind of basically clip down. Because like for the first 15 minutes, you basically have the whole like introduction of Locke where basically he's doing whole like his whole Stardew Valley you know, story. It's like this one little random farm outside of town. And just looking like a, like a former Yu-Gi-Oh protagonist just like, no, I live here. I'm just going to take care of my sheep and whatnot. But no, you got to save the battle. You're an immortal, some weird you know, space psychic thing. But no, I don't know. Akira hasn't been invented yet. We don't have that whole parallel. And then we have that for 15 minutes. And then for another solid 15 minutes, we have the introduction of Jessica and the whole um, S-Bar school for gifted children. And the problem there is just basically, you kind of like probably cut them um, back to them more back and forth instead of being like 15 minutes of this, 15 minutes of this, then the whole 30 minutes of amnesia storyline. Then you have this whole, we got to basically infiltrate this one base for about a good 20 minutes or so. And then the climax is just this big kind of drawn out it, it probably. Jump. I think it was longer like, than twenty it, it minutes. Was originally, I feel like an OVA that they kind of clipped. It's it. not longer it than feels, twenty. It definitely feels kind of disjointed. The movie as a whole, and I was yeah. I was reading a little bit about the original series, which is actually the in the article I read from ANN, which was in two thousand and eleven. The manga was still being updated periodically, um, and it's very much. It has this sense that Locke feels kind of disconnected from this story that's supposed to be about him. Which gives me reason to think that perhaps, like, the original manga, it's a little more focused on, like, his interactions with the people he meets over time throughout his incredibly long lifespan. But in the context of just this one little movie, it feels a little weird because he sort of comes in and sort of saves the day. But he feels very, like, almost a different movie. It almost feels like two different movies sort of, like, edited together. Um, the, the two different plot lines don't feel like they intermesh. Which is particularly the biggest moment where that was, um, for me, was what what was the big issue was with Jessica's plotline. Because her plotline, like, ends before the climax of the movie. And she plays, like, no role in the big climax. Yeah, that Even though they were building her arc the weird. whole time. You know what, you know what you're describing kind of reminds me of uh, James Bond, where he would ha- you would have a protagonist... And he would have his his own set of things, and he'd have like this storied past or whatever. But then the movie in question would plop him in as the protagonist of this story that largely has its own things going on. It has its own like villains and and love interest and everything. And you would cycle this out for potentially another. I think there's two other movies like this with Trojan Lock in it, and they probably uh, don't have two OVAs. OVAs. Yeah, that's it. OVAs. Um. I've actually watched a bit of the second OVA, Lord Leon, which was directed by a very uh, famous director, so that is no longer alive, Nobudu Ishiguro, and he's actually a very important director because he directed the original Macross, he directed Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Um, Interestingly enough, though, in the case of Lord Leon, that was kind of more... That one's actually a bit more Locke-focused because the main antagonist is essentially a foil to Locke ideolo- uh, ideologically. Okay. Whereas Interesting. whereas sort of in the first film, we see a bit of like how he perceives things and how you know he kind of just wants to chill and leave that life behind him. Mm-hmm. Wow. Hence why he's on the farm and why he doesn't want to tell... Uh, want to tell um, Ryu that he 
essentially is an Esper because he wants to leave that life behind him. And sort of with the second OVA, I'm pretty sure they're playing it out so that, like, you can see these two different... Um, they sort of have, like, this idea to coexist and sort of leave... Um, sort of coexist with humanity in, in spite of being disconnected from it. However, there's sort of a case where one uses their powers for revenge while the other uses it their powers to protect people. However, I think that in the case of Lord Leon, it utilizes, like, the way it's utilized is very, um, standard. I don't think it really breaks conventions in any way. Mm. Um, okay. so, yeah, huh. the sequel OVA does actually explore, from my perspective, a bit more of Locke's ideology. Um, at least from what it seems like. I have, I've only seen one of the OVAs so far. It did feel like this particular movie um, seemed to keep Locke at a bit of a distance. Um, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't delve too much into him. It, 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 it felt like he was more guest starring mm. in this movie because, like, the focus was more on basically the Jessica and the the other yeah, guy. Well, I, I think he does. I, I think he is name, the star of this movie, but like, you don't really go into his head much. Like, you see a lot of like what he does and what he's doing. You see a lot of his actions. You see him fight people. You know, there's there's one. Yeah, so kind of guest starring. He's just kind of there to be like, oh hey, you want me to see this to do this whole like you know cool trick? I don't you know, know do if it. it's guest starring. But like the more of the story itself. I don't know if it's guest starring Jessica as much as it is like you just don't really get inside his head much. Maybe it's that sort of thing where it's like uh, you have the movie st- like I don't I can't think of an example off the top of my head. Well, it's but like you know this character's on a mission and then the focal point becomes how the character can solve the mission rather than exploring the character themselves. You know what I mean? Like yeah. James Bond, right? Also, yeah. it, it felt a little bit like, um, I, I don't, I, I can't say how popular the manga was. I, if I remember correctly, it was fairly popular. Jeez, I didn't um, even know there was a manga. And, and I feel like this movie was made on the assumption that you had some familiar, familiarity, excuse me, with the source materi- material. It feels very much like that type of movie where it's just inter- it's immediately introducing these characters that people already like. And they're like, all right, now watch them do cool things. Mm. Which is satisfying for people who already know the source material. Yeah. But might be a little confusing for people later down the line. I could buy that. Yeah, I think so. Like I was saying, with like, um, it did feel like characters like Jessica were kind of invented for this movie. You know? At least, at least that's what it kind of perspected for me. It, it's it's a lot like uh, a Lupin film, you know, like any of those TV specials and stuff where they would create the character, you know, the characters around or, the main cast, and you would have the same main cast. Movie. <laughs> well, yeah, like um, like I, I uh, Evil to... or Evil or Dead is a lot like that. Uh, the case for Lady Liberty. Or Escape from Liberty. I don't remember the name of it exactly, but they steal the Statue of Liberty. Bye bye Liberty Crisis. That's what it is. Ha. Yeah. I think there though were... one interesting oh. part of this movie and why it's sort of like if you were to see Chojin Lock, I think I would recommend it sort of for what it does technically. Oh, um, I definitely agree. Because it does actually a lot of interesting things. One of the most notable things that it does that I thought was really cool was how it sort of played with fire effects where you see there's one scene in which there's like this huge fire going on and then you see that fire like reflected in Locke's hair and it's like Mm -hmm. the flames are like going through his hair and it's like it's and isn't it like live action footage it's like live action footage of fire yeah Another interesting visual thing is how many rotation shots it does, which is quite impressive yeah. for a work made before uh, CG use was common for that kind of thing. Yeah, those are a bitch usually. Um, and they had this really cool, uh, ambitious shot where like there was something, I don't even know if it was like a bullet or some, some energy or something, but it was flying through a shit ton of hallways and blowing a bunch of people up. And then it would like pass through a wall and uh, hit one of the guys and he would like disintegrate or something. Uh, there was, you know, there was this huge, really cool shot. It was kind of first-person perspective. Uh, it was really interesting. Yeah, the camera in general was just really well done for a work made at a time where you couldn't easily make 3D environments for that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. 
That's it's super fact, ambitious. It, it almost felt kind of like um, sporadic. It was it was surprising. Like they we would see a scene of two characters talking, and then the camera would just like just do this insane like rotating shot. And I'm like that was cool, but but why? But why? There, there's a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if we're if we're talking about the the technical merits of this film, I really liked the backgrounds in this. Um, yeah, while they, they while some of them seem oh, to I be remember you pointing out the planets. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they have this really cool <laughs> planet planet shots. Like uh, it kind of felt really classic. Um, that the, the sp- that scene after they blew up the base, uh, the background for that scene was excellent. Yeah. There was a few really good um, galaxy shots, and uh, even the even the down to earth ones, like all those scenes where they were just at his house with his, with the sheep and stuff, like they were surprisingly really well detailed. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed those. Yeah, I have one minor criticism of the background, one specifically where it feels like, and I pointed this out while we were watching this, uh, in terms of practicality, because there's one part where Locke is trying to track down Lady Khan, so he goes to that. He goes to that, I believe it's a university, and so the road leading there, strangely, <laughs> it's on this cliff, but it has, like, no fences or whatever, <laughs> so people who are traveling back and forth can easily fall off a cliff. Oh Like, my every God. single time. They're espers. <laughs> They're espers. They can yeah. fly. Why do they even I'm need like, ropes? Oh, like, uh, that's... <laughs> I want to say, do you want to, like, you know, yeah, just build, like, just build it on a giant mound top, yeah. and you're good. Yeah, that's yeah, security. it's aesthetic, Roger. <laughs> fences are good. <laughs> <laughs> That's really dumb. That's I, I really wins. like the the design of the spaceships as well. Very Star Warsy. Yeah, balls. This is kind of before the whole like Akira boom kind of happens. Yeah, so it's all like the Star Wars was the biggest thing that are. Yeah, I expected for, uh, it to be more Ishinomori inspired than Star Wars inspired, but it actually it did surprise me in that regard. Oh man, you know what you know what that remi- reminds me of? I remember when uh, we were watching this. Uh, how how weirdly this felt like the 80s movie uh adaptation of towards the terra uh the yeah eight- lock in lock in general is kind of like a soldier blue yeah kind of character yeah like kind of out like a little uh out there um kind of really really serious but you don't really get in his head all that much and he's just super powerful but like what's going on with him not, He's missing the headphones though. Yeah, yeah. Not, not to mention the um the the climax of this film uh has like this mother brain type thing and that's that's similar to the final boss of Towards the Terra in that film. Uh only it, it wasn't oh, done yeah, nearly right. nearly as gracefully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it gets kind of messy cuz like so he gets to the computer and it's this, it's like, ah, cause he's like, where's lady Khan? It's, it was really funny. Cause he's just running through this death star and it's the equivalent of like running through the, the star Wars death star being like, where's Emperor Palpatine? And then like, <laughs> I don't fucking, you know, whatever. Um, and he gets there and it's this giant computer. And it's like, uh, I am lady Khan. And, and he's like, you're not, uh. <laughs> <laughs> It's like okay, and then he, he destroys it, and he she's like, "Don't destroy me," and he's like, "I will," and he, he shoots like this really cool beam <laughs> attack, or or he does some. I, what did he do? It was like an arc. Uh, he, he almost thought really really hard. He, That's what. Happened. Yeah, he almost. He I, like, I know you like collapsed after that. Yeah, because it was this big attack, it was and then she's like, "No," oh, like, it's just exploding or whatever. Uh, and then like a secret door opens, and it's like, "Oh, it's her secret chamber." Uh, and she's like a literally mother brain from Metroid. Like she's in a fucking tank, like a little, like really like oozy and pussy and whatever. And she's like, Oh yeah, she was beautiful. And then she, she's <laughs> on like wheels. <laughs> Move. Yeah. She's on if, like wheels. If you don't mind me going back to the technical aspects for a second. Okay. Okay. Do you guys remember that scene where Ryu is just sitting in his room and you hear like the music playing? But then he turns off the radio, and you're like, oh. wow, I didn't realize he was actually <laughs> playing it. Yeah. Oh. Oh, my gosh. It, you, it, the, 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 like, cheesy, um, uh, what was it, like, J-pop song? Yeah, yeah, No, yeah. it was, like, a cheesy, was like, 80s scene. love ballad. And, and he's, like, staring at the ceiling all, like, uh, meditatively. Uh, I wish that, I wanted to hear that entire song. Yeah, yeah I, I love when shows play with music like that, where you think it's just, like, background music, but it ends up being an actual part of the show. <laughs> yeah, like, no, no, they're listening yeah, to it. Yeah, it'd be great. 
Yeah. Oh, man. But, like, there was a few weird cues like that with the music. I think there was one point when the music was happening, and then it just, like, really cuts really short, and everything gets dead silent at one point. It was, it was really awkward. Speaking like the of beginning of the movie. sounds, the way the movie starts, it's Locke oh, just yeah. going through his computer <laughs> looking oh at stuff, gosh, right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. But you don't... I just remembered. There's just these weird sounds and nothing else. Yeah, we it, thought our audio at first was we're like, is the audio okay? Is it just yeah. our player on our end? <laughs> you know, like, is this this can't be the movie, right? <laughs> it was just dead silent. And, well, I mean, what do you want them to do? You, they can do the whole bad Navy Superman thing where it's really dramatic music, but then it's like, oh, no, it's uh, Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually, I actually kind of liked it because they do it consistently throughout the film, so I feel like I think it kind of worked. You felt like it was more intentional. Because... Yeah, it, it was more surprising than something like that you would criticize. Yeah, it was just kind of weird. It's not what you would expect, certainly. It, it makes you like, is, is my volume on and stuff like that, which is kind of yeah, kind yeah. Of well, I mean, there should have been more like obvious. It was meant like, to be played yeah, in a like theater. Some sort of monitor noises, some sort of like computer beeping. It said like, I don't know. At least in my version, it was like almost near silent. Like I had to like raise the volume to hear like, okay, there's something. Oh, yeah, in the background. yeah. It was pretty much dead silent. It was very weird. You'd think that it'd even but, be like some I mean, this, uh, this noise. was meant to be played in a theater back in like 1984, you know? That's true. Yeah, and then you got people think like, hey, there's something wrong with the, uh, the projector or something. No, there's something wrong with your projector. I know, you gotta yeah, get that fixed. Yeah. I don't think it was a I don't think it was a bad decision. It was just kind of odd when you're not expecting it. Yeah. I mean, but like even in the newest Star Wars movie that came out recently, like there's a scene where there's silence. And there's, there's a scene where there's, like, there's silence for like 15 seconds of people like, they've had to put in some theaters I've seen silence where it's like, there is a silent scene where the audio cuts out, don't worry, it's something wrong with the projector. <laughs> so like, yeah, that's halfway I, through. I, I think that if you start that, if you start that like that, there's gonna be like, okay, is this, is this working? The, the difference know. is yeah. nowadays, like, oh, okay. oftentimes if there is like a silent scene, there's still like in some sort of ambient hum in the background. They're almost always. That's true. <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, another thing I watched involving Choji and Roku was the special um, that came out in 1979 before um, the movie was produced. And it's sort of just... Um, yeah, I watched it. it was, it's only 10 minutes long. So, essentially, the interesting thing about that is it pretty much plays out the events of the film, except it doesn't have jessica if memory yeah if memory serves it doesn't have jessica um lady khan gets introduced like really early first of all this is only 10 minutes so really early i mean and thirdly there's no dialogue there's lots of lip flaps and uh, mouth movements but there's no actual dialogue and it's so weird because uh. you'll have like this epic music being played <laughs> and characters standing and talking but they, they aren't saying, like, it's not even like one of those old silent films where you have, like, the text box. Like, they're, they're talking, but, like, nothing's going on. However, one thing I need to make note of in that is what it ends on, and it ends on the mother brain. It does not end like how the movie ends. Which leads me to believe that they added that part in later alongside the Jessica parts. Huh. Yeah, her, her departure her was really abrupt. was literally saving was saving Yamiki from herself. Yeah, yeah. so the plan was that they would traumatize her early to um, inter internalize hate for Locke, and then they would send her, train her for years, um, and then send her here and have her get amnesia and have her and Yamiki fall in love. And then she would see Locke and would um, break out of her amnesia and kill Locke. Wow, relies on a lot of <laughs> <laughs> cool. not the best plan i would say letter right time right place and hopefully you know the the guy doesn't actually actually that's one thing too like the guy just like he just goes with a like oh yeah we're in love now even though like no she was brainwashed at first to like you and you've only known her for a couple hours it's love it, it's love he, he proposes to her after like i will hear nothing else what kind of character yamaki is and i think it actually makes perfect sense why he'd stick with her i mean this the same guy who's sitting in his room staring at the ceiling oh yeah i think that's believable yeah 
I do I, think okay, I, I do I, think I, Jessica I, wasn't used maybe, as maybe well. Maybe a little more old fashioned, where it's like, okay, maybe I need to know someone for at least one whole day before I know I say I love them. I don't know. I do <laughs> think Jessica was underused in the film. Uh, she definitely could have been used better. I mean, she's like supposed to be one of the most powerful espers, and then she just totally disappears in the second half, where she would be to- like incredibly useful. Well, I actually think the way they got her to they got her to hate Locke was kind of contrived because, like, you'd think, oh, okay, maybe like there's an Esper that has a power maybe to, like, uh, create illusions or something so that she sees Locke there when he really isn't or something like that. But no, they he puts on the guy puts on a Locke mask and all of a sudden <laughs> he's able to, like, to me to me that was a little silly. I mean, initially yeah. we all uh, expected that it would just have been Locke used to be, like, a mercenary who was, like, not a good guy. And that's why he sort of, like, exiled himself and gotten away yeah. from this life. Which well, I'm actually glad sense. they didn't go with that, because that would have been, that would have been kind of predictable. Um, however, I do think what would have been more interesting was had it been like an illusion because they do play with illusions quite a bit in the film and sort of like uh there's these parts in the film where you kind of wonder how much of this is really going on how much of this is an illusion you have like the the checkerboard uh not really checkerboard like the uh the grids and sort of Mm -hmm. when it goes like when she's training or whatever so they could have played with that a bit yeah, I think there are a lot of missed opportunities in the film. Not that it's bad, but, like, there's clearly areas where it could be improved, um, both in regards to Jessica. That whole subplot could definitely be improved, and I think Locke could have gone and fleshed out a bit more to make him more sympathetic as a protagonist. I, I, I mean... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, it's not like there's nothing interesting about him, but I definitely do feel like we could have gotten a little more of his ideology, like why he wanted to just live on the farm in the first place. A little more of that would have made me a lot more interested in his character. What what I would have liked to see a lot more de- development into was his relationship with Cornelia, because I think they had a very like interesting dynamic, and I would have liked to see more more behind that. Yeah, I think if they'd fussed that out, um, her forgetting who he was would have been a lot more interesting. I, I w- Oh, wait. Was something someone else saying something? No, no, no. I, I just on. wanted to briefly... <laughs> it's like every, every time I jump in, it's right as somebody else does. I just wanted to briefly touch on the soundtrack as the resident music nerd. Um, since we talked a little bit about the, the soundtrack less opening, but... Um, I think the soundtrack overall has a lot of really good moments, but there's a, a kind of strange lack of, uh, what's the word, uh, balance between everything or consistency. So we have, in in the action scenes, we have this really groovy like synth music that's um, really fun and really like sort of just very of its time, but in a good way. But then we also have this really heavy brassy um spacey type of music very heavily inspired by star wars clearly by the star wars soundtrack for like the space scenes and then we also have these like pining romantic strings for the more emotional moments and it feels kind of disconnected from each other especially sort of emotionally because i feel like we're supposed to be really it wants us to be involved in the characters' plates on, like, a a deeper level. Yet, when it comes to the action sequences that are supposed to be very intense and dramatic, they're playing this very, like, fun, upbeat music that feels more like it belongs in, like, a movie where it's more... it's to be taken less seriously. Yeah, that's... to kind of just follow... following that. The big thing was just, like... They had a good idea, but the way they wanted to go about that, I felt like they had like multiple people with different directions where they want to go with it. Like the big thing was um, like how they try to show some of the characters' thoughts and how they use their abilities. Like with Jessica and a few others, just like trying to depict like you know, 
mentally how they're like, using their powers and how that was affecting them mentally. Sometimes it's just simple, like, okay, a flashback or, like, one thought or something like that. And you get some of these really good, like, POV shots, and there's, like, some of these, like, very abstract-like images where, like, a lot of the color fades out or it's just basically silhouettes or the fire and the hair. Like, all these really good ideas, but just really, like, there's no one, like, theme or just one overall, I guess, aesthetic, I should say, that just kind of overarchs everything. Now, that kind of works in some regards because, like, all the powers are different, all the characters are different. But it just feels like we just put things in here because, oh, that'd be cool here, that'd be cool there. There's no logic with logic with it, sorry. Yeah, I think part of what leads to it being less memorable is that lack of cohesion. Because people really grab onto that. Especially um, the use of themes is the most common way there's cohesion, but also musical style and instrumentation are other ways that you can achieve that. Mm-hmm. I, um, you were touching on something that, nice guy, you were touching on the visuals a little bit, how it feels very, um, it, it, this was something I was thinking about while watching it really strongly, and as I was thinking about it more afterwards, leading up to this podcast, it really, um, f- it feels like this movie was designed more from a visual perspective first, both in that sense where, I don't know if you can relate to this, but like, you're, you come up with a great story idea. And you think of the ending first. You just have, you don't even know what the characters are or what's going on in the movie, but you just have this image of your mind, in your mind of like a really powerful moment. And I feel like this scene is, this movie was constructed out of a lot of scenes that were like aesthetically powerful, but not really um, built, not really backed by the story. For instance, the scene where Cornelia is choosing between the two dresses and she has to throw away the she's she throws away the the pretty dress for the suit of armor and this is supposed to be like a heavy moment but we don't this hasn't really been built up beforehand to very much to give it weight yeah it was just like it felt like multiple people like okay you tackled this scene you tackled this scene and there's we're not gonna really talk over like we're not gonna like give each other notes. Oh, I actually thought part. that scene that you're describing like, with Cornelia was actually quite clever because you also have the mirror and the reflection of herself, which also goes with sort of the gaze. No, I mean it's it's a good scene, yes, but the problem is that it's at the wrong time. Like that should be like that should have been earlier on, like maybe the end of the first act, not like basically us halfway through getting near the. That, yeah, I think I third. agree. I think it's a great scene, actually. I really like it, especially visually. But I feel like it was constrict constructed first. Like that scene was thought up before, and there's not the the backbone to the scene to give it sort of a context within the movie. It's like a lot of things are said but not really shown. Like near the end, there's the whole basically there's the big explosions where basically, oh my god, we basically took out the. Uh, Basically, I don't think it is mother, or not mother, but just basically Metroid. The brain, basically. <laughs> and it's like two-thirds of this giant spaceship basically explode while the rest is ba- the final piece is trying to get away from the sun. And it's like, oh my god, all these espers died. Yet we never saw them, we never saw the rest of the base, really. So it's like, don't really feel the weight of something that probably was supposed to be established earlier on, but it just kind of, oh, it happened. We were told it happened. Like, there's that's the thing. Like, you know, great visuals at some times, great plot moments and all stuff, but a lot of things are just basically told. Like, the reason, like, you know, like I, I think it's kind of ironic, the whole fact that Jessica's main motivation in the entire film was, like, she was just told, like, yeah, you're not supposed to like this guy, you're not supposed to like Locke. And then Locke's whole thing, when the reason he came back, was like, hey, you're being told, like, oh, yeah, there's all this problem now, we need well, your help. Jessica isn't then, told like, not to like first, this guy, she doesn't like this guy because he killed, he killed her family. Yeah, but but the brain, no, the brainwashing. No, thing. no, no. That's not brainwashing. That was a disguise. Lock, lock. That's why she doesn't like him. I, I, I know, but it's. But didn't they do the whole with the with the magic wand stick thing? Like kind of like really pushed her over the edge. Well, she it. was being trained. Before I was like, you know, she was like, oh yeah, yeah I was being yeah, trained, was... but it wasn't. Yeah, they like... were trying to push her mental capabilities to increase her powers. That mm-hmm. was the purpose of it. Yeah, but she wasn't, like, brainwashed. She does not like him because he murdered her family. Or at least she believes that to be the case. Well, yeah. 
I find it somewhat interesting that um, in the, the the conclusion of the movie, um, is for the most part fairly happy, but it ends with essentially um, Jessica getting brainwashed again because they, if I'm recalling correctly, they erase her movies of everything that trans her memories of everything that transpired in this movie and she basically is the sort of blank slate character that she became after she got amnesia and goes off with um yamaki yep mm -hmm. which i i feel like is a at least to me um is a more bittersweet than um than the happy ending i feel like it's making it out to be as a whole, that's something that I thought was pretty interesting about this movie, is that even though we have this clear, like, there's these clear bad guys, you always sort of feel in a similar way as Locke does, where it's kind of disconnected from both sides. Like, neither side feels like something you can really grab onto as, oh, these guys are definitely, you know, always in the right. I, I definitely felt myself relating a little bit more to how Locke is kind of like, just a bit distant from all this conflict and doesn't want to get involved with it unless he absolutely of, has to. I think one of the reasons for that is just that they don't really flesh out the Republic or whatever at all. Like, we don't know anything about them as, like, an organization or a government. All, like, whereas, on the other hand, we actually know about, Lady, like, Lady Khan's group, even if they're bad. We actually have, like, something to grasp onto, which makes them a little more... It makes it harder to see the Republic as just, like, the superior option when we don't even know anything about them yeah what yeah when he was fighting when Locke was fighting them in the the planet that looked kind of like mars it was all orange and mm -hmm. he we have this whole crew of aliens there that all have these really like great goofy designs i was like i want to see a show about these guys yeah Design-wise, um, I guess I'll bring that up. We talked about it a little earlier um, uh, prior to this podcast. It, it, it's kind of interesting because some characters have this very clear um, anime aesthetic, but then um, other characters look like they could easily have been placed in like a Western show from the late 90s, um, and they would fit in there perfectly. I mean, are you referring to, in that regard, like Lady Khan's group? Who feels um, less anime? It, it's more um, just uh, just like straight up like character design, not even like personality. That it stuck out. To yeah, me. yeah, it's I know just, what like, you're random... talking about. The the designs of Lady Khan's group, right? Definitely more so with them, but it would also just I would notice like random people like throughout, like maybe in the background or like on the spaceship, there would be a guy here and there that just looks. Um, uh, more m very western in comparison to um, the other designs whereas Locke yeah because i think a character like Japanese. jessica definitely looks like moe you know yeah mm -hmm. i feel like we're the we're, we're starting to run run a little thin i'm going to bring up one last thing and then we'll get into our final thoughts and that is the dub we mentioned it earlier but um did, did everyone here watch it dubbed? I think I'm the only this? one who watched it subbed. All right. Well, g give us your thoughts on the sub since I didn't watch it subbed. Uh, it was fine. You know, just regular voice acting. Nothing important or special about it. There are no roles that really stood out to me as particularly well done or anything. All right. Does anyone want to weigh in on the dub? Because I thought the dub was pretty interesting. That, that would be one word to describe it, definitely. My personal opinion would be uh, the best way to describe it for me was like if this was a B movie kind of thing. So it's like you had Star Wars, and then basically kind of the acting was like not the best, but it was kind of like okay, we're trying, we're still trying, but we're kind of like a little melodramatic, little um, kind of fully um, expressive at sometimes. So it kind of gave it this I don't want to say a cheese, but it's like it, I don't know. They're trying, but they're not professional kind of thing, if I had to be honest. One of the things that felt um, interesting to me about it is it it definitely feels... It, it even feels a little bit older than um, its time. Like, this was produced 1984. I think the 
the dub was released a little bit after, not too late after. But the voice acting feels like I'm watching um, like a black and white TV show from like the, I don't know, like like in the era of like the Dick Van Dyke show and that type of thing. The way they voice act all the characters feels very much in that type of vein, especially the male characters, but even the female ones. Um, it, it's it's an interesting experience, especially compared to the way anime dubs now have become. Not to say anime dubs now are bad. They're definitely much higher quality on average, but they have this sort of um, style to them that you can expect from most dubs. And this dub has a, a unique character to it that I really enjoyed. So I think... Um, we should just give our, our, like, I don't know, two, two sentence or a paragraph review or whatever, our final thoughts on this movie and, I don't know, uh, how strongly you would recommend it to others, if you would. Um, so let's go by the order it is in Discord, so uh, Mr. Nice Guy, you're first up. Uh, it depends, honestly. I mean, on one hand, if you're okay with, like, older animation, older kind of stories, not really judging it by today's standards, if you can get past all that. For the time, it works like, as, it works like a very good B-movie, best way to put it. It's not this, nothing revolutionary, nothing that's really gonna, you know, amaze you. There are moments that I think are really good animation-wise. The plot itself, idea-wise, I think is really good. Execution is the biggest problem here, though. Like, would I say watch it? Yeah, if you're basically, you know, you're just, you know, it's a weekday night, you have nothing to do, just want to relax for a little bit, it's a good ride. However, for any reason, like, you're trying to find something out of it, maybe something else. Roger Smith, how did you feel? Uh, I thought it was a pretty alright time. Uh, it started out pretty slow, and actually, interestingly enough, I planned on watching the movie a while ago, and I had started it and gotten about 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, and to me it just felt like very slow at the time, and I couldn't really, you know, I was kind of busy, so I didn't really want to take the time to watch a two-hour movie, <laughs> but when I got back to it, um, it surprisingly didn't feel as slow as I remembered, still a little slow, but not quite as much, and I think as a piece of entertainment, it was a decent time, it had some interesting food for thought here. Not nothing really gets explored enough in any in really any meaningful way to be like something astounding or like one of the greats. But as like something you put on one night to see like some cool technical capabilities of 80s anime, to see some like cool fights, a few interesting ideas. You know, it's not a bad time. I would recommend. I would recommend it over the uh, toward the Terra film. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess there's that. Good, good. Um, Shabes, how did you feel? Oh, you're gonna have to check the voice chat for his. Oh no. Answer. <laughs> I did not even see the voice chat. Okay, here here's what Shabes says. Uh, I'll read. Uh, Lock is good schlock. Funny laughing face, very good pun, Shabes. I am I'm, I'm very proud of you. If you like sci-fi and retro shows, it's a fair treat. Just don't try it if you're the nit nitpicky type. And then lots of ah, uh, thank you, Zaria. How did you feel? Um, I would definitely recommend it if you're interested in like mid '80s style movies and OVAs. Just don't go into it expecting. A lot of depth or anything it has some cool technical moments and some cool set pieces but i wouldn't call it i don't know it's kind of like a hollywood movie in that respect yeah and uh i'll weigh in with my thoughts since i didn't go first i would say pretty much it was a fun time there was enough interesting aspects to it that i don't regret watching it for every scene I didn't like, there would be a scene with, like, an interesting cut of animation, or they would frame the shot in a really unique way, or they would use really interesting colors or effects. So I enjoyed it, and the dub was fun, made it a more fun experience overall. 
and there were certainly some good uh, meme moments here and there uh, that made me <laughs> chuckle. <laughs> so overall, I would say, yeah, if you if you think you if this sounds like your type of movie based on hearing it, then go for it. Um, though it does definitely drag in the third act, it gets a little slow. But overall, that's I think our general thoughts, and I think I'll be closing it out here. I do want to mention for anybody who wants to follow along, um, the next episode of the podcast, we will be discussing, um, I've forgotten the name of the show. Um, Card Captor Sakura. How did I forget that? <laughs> I, I, was, I was stuck on Sakura, but I was like, there's something before that. Yeah, we'll be discussing Card Captor Sakura episodes 1 through 10. Um, but that's all for now. I'll see you all later. Bye. Bye. Don't forget to like and subscribe.